Of course, the Chinese economy is now expected to overtake ours in size in purchasing power terms in 2016 before President Obama leaves office. And China will almost certainly overtake us in nominal exchange rate terms before the 2021 centenary of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the Economist says that's going to happen in 2018, but I don't trust any communist or economist. <laughs> um, in 1972, China's worldwide imports and exports total came to $6.3 billion, including U.S.-China trade of about $95 million. Last year, China's trade in goods alone was $3.9 trillion. U.S.-China trade in goods and services came to $536 billion. There was no investment by either country in the other in 1972. Now there's U.S. investment everywhere in China and our states and localities and ham manufacturers are pushing for some sort of open door policy for Chinese investment in the United States. In 1972, there were no Chinese tourists or students in the United States or anywhere else for that matter. A few hundred Americans managed to visit China that year. This year, there are over 200,000 Chinese students here Almost one and a half million Chinese tourists will visit the United States this year, and over two million Americans will go to China. By the way, Chinese tourists last year internationally spent $67 billion on travel. So this is just remarkable. Um, anyway, you get the point. This is a very consequential relationship that's in the, that's in the process of becoming more so. Uh, I don't have to drone on for you to appreciate the extraordinary dynamism of China and of U.S.-China relations and their effects on Asia and the world. And having just waxed uncharacteristically numerical, I want to assure you that while there are many references to facts and figures in my book, uh, there are no dreary charts and graphs or statistical recitations in interesting times. Um, those of you who are purists will, of course, know that uh, uh, the famous Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times, does not exist. Um, so the question is, where did that come from? I owe the title of the book to my publisher, uh, who thought, and I agree with, her, agree with her, that it captured the spirit of the exciting, trying, exhilarating, exasperating, and always surprising progress that China, the United States, and the world have registered over the past uh, half century. Um, let me therefore say, that I'd give you the explanation of where this comes from, which I did a lot of research on. Um, it was apparently coined by the British ambassador to China, Sir Hugh with an E, Montgomery Natchbull Hugeson KCMG, around 1937 after he had what he thought was the interesting experience of being strafed by Japanese fighter aircraft in Shanghai. Uh, and he thought of this while he was in the hospital, uh, which he thought was an interesting time. Um, so the curse does originate in China, but given the inscrutability of Sir Hugh's name, no one's ever been able to remember uh, who, for long who first uttered it or where. Um, uh, in fact, living in interesting times doesn't even have a Chinese translation. In my view, the energetically uh, vexing uncertainties of modern life in China deserve succinct expression in a snappy four-character phrase. Uh, so I'm hereby calling for crowdsourcing of a chuggy uh, to translate uh, may live in interesting times. Uh, the book itself uh, may be uh, the best way to describe it is to refer to the mystical, the mythical Chinese animal called the Sibuxian. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a beast that resembles, uh, does not resemble four others. Um, that is, this, this beast has a cow's hooves, but it does not move. It has a horse's head, but you can't pass it off as beef in European butcher shops. Uh, it it uh, has a deer's antlers but it doesn't live near strip malls in the New Jersey suburbs. Um, it has a donkey's body, but it's not an ass. And some say its bite is fame fatal, and uh, some are simply horrified by it. So this book may horrify a few people, but I don't think it will kill anybody. Uh, like a Sipu Xiang, it's 
it's tempting to define the book in terms of what it isn't. It's not your common Washington suck up to the administration of the day. <laughs> Work of sinology, think tank study, or belief tank polemic. It contains an anecdote or two, and for better or ill, it reflects the author's mind place and perspective about things when they happen, but it's not an autobiography. Nor is it a Washington insider story about how the author invented devilishly clever policies and personally sold the president on them you know, and then imposed them on unsuspecting foreigners. This is not what it is. This book expresses my views rather than those of any institution or group of like-minded people. In some, it reflects who I was and who I am and what I saw and see changing in and with China. I was a career diplomat. I continue to think like one even if I don't speak that way. <laughs> I am a businessman who dabbles in sinology, not a sinologist, securocrat, or policy wonk who dabbles in diplomacy or business. <laughs> so um, I want to just close these, uh, these very brief remarks um, by uh, saying that the book does contain uh, a fair amount of exploration of um, how China changed, yes, and of the nature of what I call cadre capitalism, that is, uh, otherwise known as socialism or Leninism, if you, Leninism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, cadre capitalism is something new. For ideological reasons, it's very poorly understood in China and uh, hardly understood at all uh, outside China. Cadre capitalism is a party-based system that links political boosterism to economic entrepreneurship. It makes so-called state-owned state enterprises formidably competitive and business in China highly efficient. It's a unique artifact of Chinese culture that, in my view, cannot be exported as a model or borrowed abroad, and I explain that in the book. Perhaps that's just as well, because if corruption is at heart the result of an inability to separate personal interests from public or enterprise interests, then cadre capitalism promotes corruption as well as business efficiency. Um, interesting Times spends a lot of time looking at the origins and evolution of the question of Taiwan's relationship with the rest of China and America's role in this. One online piece, again, looks at Taiwan in strategic history from the 17th century to the current day. And um, mostly, however, the book tracks the evolution of the Taiwan issue in U.S.-China relations in whose development it remains a significant inhibition. And it examines the effects on China's neighbors and the United States of China's remarkable return to wealth and power. It looks back 40 years, but as I said, it also tries to look ahead another 40. It seems to me, that in this regard, that we are at a turning point. The inherited framework for U.S.-China relations has exceeded its useful life. I spoke about that at length at the National War College on May 7, um, and that talk is online. I'm not going to recapitulate it, uh, but uh, we are, we have pivoted into a new era in which we need to find a new set of rules to govern a relationship that is now evolving in ways that were never contemplated uh, by the founding fathers. Uh, of this relationship. I see Roxanne Wickey there, so I should say founding mother also. Um, um, tomorrow, President Obama and President Xi Jinping will see whether they can begin to come up with a new framework for, that better suits China's rise to wealth and power and our somewhat reduced global influence and economic straits. There is a lot at stake in their discussions. I hope they'll rise above the staff work. Having done staff work, I know what that is. I hope they will rise above the staff work that has prepared for this summit and have a real meeting of the minds. As anyone who reads Interesting Times will detect, I am an optimist on U.S.-China relations. I believe that our interests 
dictate cooperation rather than antagonism. But I'm also a realist. At the moment, the forces pushing us toward a hostile relationship are not in any respect weaker than those bringing us together. Um, in the book, I argue that we have the capacity to choose whether we will have a mutually advantageous relationship with China or not. I think this now hangs in the balance. What happens is beyond my capacity or that of anyone here tonight, even Steve Orleans, uh, uh, to influence. Uh, I have my fingers crossed about the meeting that's about to take place. I think there's a huge amount at stake, uh, both for both countries uh, and ultimately for the world. And I will stop here, and I hope we can have a dialogue. You were there at the beginning, so I think the only kind of analogy that comes to mind about the meeting tomorrow is actually the time that, that you were the principal translator in 1972 that you literally that led to a redirect complete redirection of the relationship obviously we're not looking at a redirection today but we're looking at molding a new framework that you put it what lessons would you say we should take from that visit and apply it to and president obama should apply to the next couple of days if i may sit down um and, and speak to you um Let's remember what the Shanghai communique, which was the result of that meeting, was. Uh, the first four pages or so of it uh, were a recitation of very sharp differences between the United States and China on virtually everything. Um, there were reasons for us to uh, make uh, those statements and to state our differences because we each had allies and friends whom we wish to reassure uh, we were not selling them out. And therefore, we had to restate our existing positions uh, quite directly and, and forcefully. Um, but the communique then went on to say, notwithstanding all these differences, and notwithstanding the fact that we have a different social and, econ and economic systems, we have concluded that it is in our interest to cooperate strategically. So the first lesson is, maybe there are two lessons in that. One is that uh, petty disagreements can be subsumed in larger agreement if statesmanship is applied. The second is that ideological ceasefires are useful because the Shanghai communique did represent an ideological ceasefire. On the crucial issue of Taiwan in that communique, we found a way to not quite agree to disagree, uh, but to disagree without um, without uh, coming to blows. Uh, we basically acknowledged the Chinese position and said we didn't challenge it on, in essence. Um, that was clever. That shows that diplomacy actually can sometimes work if clever people apply their minds to the issue, the issues. So I think the lessons are that um, one must keep one's eye on what one's national interests are and pursue those rather than all of the petty vested interests and special interests which are clamoring for attention. Um, and one must think in long term, in, long, long, in the long term, not just in the short term. Um, I am somewhat apprehensive about this summit because I live in Washington. I've come up here for this occasion breathing the nice, clean, political, free air of New York. Uh, um, and, um, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm living in a city where we can't pass a budget, where nobody speaks civilly to anybody, uh, where um, there is no agreement whatsoever on anything uh, that's got a duration of more than one or two days. And, uh, you know, I travel around the world uh, and meet lots of people in interesting places uh, in the Middle East and, 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 and the Far East. And, and I have yet to encounter anyone who, who says, gosh, where's our John Boehner when we need him? <laughs> you know, um, our system is not functional. And um, 
So the question is, in a system, if the system is not functioning, if it is, um, if it is characterized by budgetary bloat, political constipation, uh, strategic myopia. What did I say about chess? And, uh, <laughs> um, then why should we expect that this meeting will actually deal with things at the strategic level? And the answer is, in the end, we have to look to the man we elected as Thank president. Uh, he's got to do what I suggested he has to do, that is rise above the pettifoggery of his own staff. Should we have a new communique? There are those who've called for, you know, who agree with you that say the framework that's worked for the last 41 years is too frayed and doesn't, doesn't work. And should we have a new communique? That's something more than what we had after the Obama visit in 2009. I think the relationship is vastly too complicated to summarize in a new, new, new communique. I think that would be a, an exercise in futility. Uh, and I don't think the governments on either side really are very obedient, obedient to guidance of that general sort anymore. So I wouldn't waste time trying to do that. Uh, but I do want to note, this is the most strategically volatile relationship in the world over the last 70 years. Let me illustrate, I, I said I wasn't going to repeat my war college speech, but let me summarize some points. Um, and in World War II, we were the ally of uh, what we thought was a uh, securely Christian uh, democratic China run by uh, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek and his lovely wife. Uh, and, um, and FDR believed that after the war, the world should be run by what he called the four policemen. And he, what he meant by that was uh, that we would run the Western Hemisphere, Russia would run East, East, uh, Eastern Europe and, Euro and Central Asia, the Brits would run Western Europe and their empire, and the Chinese would run Asia. Uh, and since the Chinese were weak, they'd have to take our advice, and we would really be running it. I think that was what he thought. Uh, well, that concept didn't survive contact with the Soviet Union and um, predatory uh, communism. Um, and so we went to the other extreme. Uh, we did uh, containment on steroids. You couldn't use the dollar to do anything with Chinese or China. I mean, what, what we did to, to China in terms of the effort to isolate it put, uh, puts what we're doing to Iran uh, to shame. Uh, and that went on for 20 years. Uh, so that was another framework, a second framework, uh, totally opposite. And then Nixon had a bright idea, and we shifted into yet another framework, this time trying to align China with us against the Soviet Union, which we did with some success. We had an entente with China, even as we had a sort of detente with, 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 with Russia. And that lasted for quite a while. And then uh, the Soviet Union uh, irresponsibly croaked, um, leaving us with no enemy. And we were suffering from enemy deprivation syndrome, and we have been doing that ever since. Uh, but um, the fact is that um, uh, we, uh, we went into a period of muddle. Um, not only did the Soviet Union croak, but the, the, so the, the Tiananmen incident happened, and the warmth went out of the China relations. And so the strategic rationale collapsed, and so did the impetus for close relations. So we tried first, if you remember, in the Clinton administration in the early years, so we tried first to bludgeon China into compliance with our human rights uh, principles. And when China didn't yield to that, we then retreated to the idea of incorporating China into the global order, WTO, and so forth. And, and that's basically been where we've been. But China is now incorporated into the order. So what is our framework now? How do we see China? Um, and that's the question. Uh, and and how so, do you see it? And the question, how do I see it? Yeah, how, what should that framework look like? Uh, well, I think, it should look, I think to begin with, uh, it needs to begin. It needs to begin by recognizing that we do have uh, rules of international law and order, uh, which uh, strangely the Chinese are defending. Um, the UN Charter uh, is never referred to by any American statesman or even politician or rascal, uh, except in negative terms. Uh, we have we have issues with with a lot of people about what the world order ought to look like. Um, 
Uh, China is a great defender of the Westphalian system. That is absolute sovereignty. That's why we don't agree about Syria. Because China is not going to allow the precedent of Libya, as they see it, to be applied to Syria. What was the precedent of Libya? Uh, the UN passed a resolution authorizing a very limited form of military intervention called a no-fly zone that was stretched by NATO a la carte uh, into an open campaign for regime change uh, with all sorts of consequences which I won't go into but they're not good um, and uh, basically the Chinese are saying you're not going to connive in creating instability and horrors inside yet another country and then use those horrors as an excuse to do regime change. Um, so uh, we have a disagreement about, or, so the first thing we need to do is recognize that we're not gonna be able to change the international order. China's bought into the international order that we created, but it's not gonna let us change it unilaterally. We're gonna have to consult with the Chinese. They have to, and not just the Chinese, but the Indians. And not just the Indians, but the Japanese. And this is a world in which we are not the center, there is no center, and we need to re reorganize our own way of thinking and deal with the Chinese as equal partners in a much wider grouping than we have been accustomed to. That's point one, world order. Uh, second uh, is that uh, we either have an interest in the rule of law or we don't. Um, weak countries, China is vulnerable in many respects and still considers itself weak for many reasons, like rules because they protect them. Uh, we got very strong after the end of the Cold War and we weren't very interested in rules anymore. I think we need to start sit down with the Chinese and examine the rules and see whether we can reaffirm them or not. Um, we have differences on interpretation of all sorts of things. Law of the sea, for example. Um, that's a very complex topic I won't pursue. Um, I think there is a basis for partnership between the United States and China in the economic and financial area that is unexploited. Um, we have uh, man-eating potholes in this country now, um, as well as bridges that fall down all over the place and roads that are inadequate. Uh, infrastructure that is decaying. There's supposed to be a $2 trillion deficit in our infrastructure. We are disinvesting in our human infrastructure, in our educational system. Um, and China's got a lot of little green portraits of dead presidents, dollars, um, which it would like to exchange for something real. Uh, I think we should have a major investment partnership with the Chinese funding a lot of the rebuilding of America, and I don't think that's impossible. Um, I think we need to straighten out our attitude on, uh, on foreign investment. Uh, we need the money. Um, when I hear the reaction to the Smithfield ham purchased by Shuang Hui, uh, Shinewei, I guess in English, um, uh, that somehow our precious um, um, uh, ham or pork or bacon is being the Air Force, you know, gets up every morning and they eat grits and ham and the Chinese are somehow going to control the Air Force by um, <laughs> manipulating the supply contracts. Um, you know, I think we need to grow up um, and we need to have an honest discussion uh, with the Chinese about the issue of uh, the barriers that they have to our investment right. and we need to engage in reciprocal negotiation. Final point, uh, which illustrates lots of issues. Uh, the much ballyhooed cyber uh, space issue. Uh, what is cyberspace? Uh, well, from the point of view of people in this room, it's a way of communicating on your smartphone. Um, I think I'm one of the last three human beings alive who doesn't have a smartphone. Um, but the, um, you don't have a smartphone? Congratulations. Uh, there are two of us. Um, so, um, uh, but it is much more than that. It is a new domain for purposes of strategic interaction. If you think in military terms, um, in terms of military operations, uh, there is the land, which is a military domain. It is surrounded by the sea, 
and this you can get from the sea to the land in many places. Therefore, in a sense, the sea is a superior domain to the land. This is not the US Navy argument, by the way. Um, and over the sea and the land is the air, which is above them both. In military terms, you always want the high ground. Above the air is space, yet a higher domain. And above that, permeating everything that human beings do now is cyberspace. It is the supreme domain. And when human beings discover a new domain, the first thing we do is militarize it. Um, and, well, and then we sneak through it to try to steal other people's secrets. So we have two problems with the Chinese. We have a problem of industrial espionage and uh, intellectual property theft, uh, which is something we need to deal with. Uh, and in fact, we've agreed to talk to each other. And I'm pretty confident that we can work out rules of the road for this domain as we have for the sea and the land and the air. Um, not yet space. <coughs> and then we have the problem of the use of cyberspace to cripple the economy and the society of another country. And the power of this, if you think of Hurricane Sandy here in New York, probably some of you remember it, um, uh, that was nothing compared to what a cyber attack could do. Uh, so um, we need there, I think, to come to grips with the new strategic reality, which is that we require something like mutual assured destruction, right. a doctrine that recognizes that the use of this domain for attack will invite such devastating response that it should never be attempted. And it's not just the US and China, by the way, it's the US and Russia, it's India and China, it's a, a whole series of combinations of countries that have got to deal with the fact that human beings now have a new playground for our military toys. Um, and uh, uh, anybody who has little boys in their family knows how quickly they take to the opportunity to use, uh, use military toys. So, so I think, I, I don't see a problem and sitting down and trying to work through some of these larger issues. I hope the two presidents will do it. Um, I'll keep my fingers crossed. Well, certainly on the cyber, I think the mutual, I mean, the mutual assured destruction, we can deter state actors, that the Chinese, Russians, anybody else will know that if there is a major cyber attack, you know, that will be met with a response. Espionage, I assume we allow, I mean, we do it, they do it, that continues. The difference with the Chinese is there, what the U.S. government is saying is there is a state policy that is fostering intellectual property right theft ah. through the cyber. Yeah, no, I and, and that's and that's a huge problem. Is that what I will write tomorrow? What will come out tomorrow is I will be saying, which I think is makes perfect sense, is if there is going to be this new great power relationship that C talks about, that Obama seems to be accepting. If you're stealing my industrial base, there can't be a new kind of relationship. That that mm -hmm. needs to be fixed. Well, um, I agree it does need to be fixed. Um, I, it's nothing new. Alexander Hamilton, who had a, a policy for industrializing the United States, hired two guys immediately after our independence to go to Great Britain and steal all of their <laughs> industrial technology, which they did quite successfully. Uh, which was the basis of a lot of industri industrial development, primarily in New England initially. Um, when I was Assistant Secretary of Defense, four days after I got onto the job, um, a, um, a certain European country, ribbit, 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 um, um, was called in uh, uh, when it uh, appeared that they had been caught red-handed uh, doing something quite similar. Um, I think. Yes, it's a problem. Yes, we need to deal with it. It's not impossible to deal with. Um, and, um, and by the way, um, uh, when and if, as is the case in an increasing number of technological fields, the United States is no longer the leader, I hope we have the wit to spend some time studying and learning the technology of others, preferably by legitimate means. But if not, well, I mean, anything goes. <laughs> Last question, then I want to open it up to, to questions from, from our members and audience. You're a fluent Chinese speaker. 
um, the you know Yan Chet Shi, you know the whole Chinese foreign policy senior levels or fluent English speakers. We don't have any in the U.S. We don't have any fluent English speakers. We don't have any fluent Chinese speakers we in the higher reaches. In the higher reaches of the U.S. government, do you think there's an implication for policy in that when you're looking at it, or is it just okay? It doesn't matter. No, I think it matters incredibly. I don't think the problem, however, is limited to U.S.-China interaction. Um, the deprofessionalization of our diplomatic service the replacement of diplomats by political appointees whose principal qualification is an academic degree and a heavy wallet uh, and possibly a momentary uh, hit and run friendship with whoever it was that was running for office um, but, uh, that they befriended uh, is a real problem. Um, in our bureaucracy in Washington, uniquely among countries in the world these days, uh, the senior people who make policy decisions on all key relationships have no prior experience, by and large, with either uh, diplomacy or with foreign cultures. Um, so um, this is a problem. Uh, we cannot, uh, we're, we're so determined to be read that we're not expert anymore. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, I say that only slightly facetiously because really it's an ideological, ideological rectitude, political correctness are valued far more than expertise. Now, you can carry expertise too far. You know, an expert is someone who uh, quibbles over the details while the, while the whole, whole thing is going off the rails. Uh, so, uh, we do have to have people who stand back and see things in a broader perspective, and we have to hope that those are the sorts of people we, we elect, but I think it's a problem. Um, I think specifically in the case of the U.S. and China, um, it's, a, it's a mixed issue. On the one hand, there are vastly more people um, now studying Chinese in the United States um, than there ever were before, and uh, a lot of them have spent significant time in China, and their Chinese is really solid. Um, and, and I think much better than that of, uh, of previous uh, generations. Um, China, as you said, has done an incredible job of uh, teaching English. Um, it has promoted people in its diplomatic service. You look at, at, at many of them, Yang Jiechi being a case in point, uh, uh, was a former interpreter for Deng Xiaoping, um, very comfortable in English. When he hears English, He's hearing Chinese in his head as well as English, and he's very attuned to nuance. Uh, it helps uh, to have had that experience. Um, but I think, yes, we have a problem, and uh, it's a bigger one than just US and China. I don't find people, um, no, there's nobody who speaks Arabic um, working on the Middle East, really. Um, uh, and. Uh, the, uh, the very few people who are working on matters in Europe actually speak European languages. Um, and that's remarkable. Um, so uh, China's not the only one. You look at U.S.-Japan relations, how many American officials at senior levels know Japanese? Um, so we need, to, we need to recognize as a country that our margin for error is not what it once was. And we need to be more nimble, we need to be more agile, we need to be smarter. Uh, we need to try harder. We we can we don't we are not going to get by if we continue to be complacent. Open the floor to questions. Bill, um, look, do we have a, a mic? Uh, oh, I I speak loud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Bill Armbruster. Uh, what do you, how do you see this relationship evolving over the next forty years? What do you think it might be like in twenty fifty three? <laughs> well, I think, um, as I said, I think a great deal actually does depend on what happens tomorrow and the day after. Um, because um, there are certain irritants in this relationship. Uh, we've been talking about cyber espionage, which is clearly one on our side, which strikes at the heart of the relationship because it affects the business community. And the business community has been the major voice uh, for stability in U.S.-China relations from the beginning. And if that community uh, loses its enthusiasm for the China relationship, uh, then that relationship is in real trouble. Uh, on the Chinese side, there's always another story. 
uh, aggressive U.S. naval reconnaissance along the Chinese coast, both in the air and on the surface and under the water, uh, designed to provoke the Chinese into reactions, uh, to test their defenses, and to choreograph ways through them. Very threatening. Uh, very annoying. Every Chinese senior military leader in a military region along the coast has experienced this firsthand. If you wanted to socialize a group of people into hostility toward you, you could not pick a better method of doing it. Um, so, uh, what does this do? Uh, it does several things. First of all, uh, it, it's great for the Chinese naval budget. Um, and, uh, and for innovation in coastal defense systems. Uh, and it is also a perfect excuse to do to us through cyberspace what we are doing on the sea and air. Thinking of cyberspace as a domain equivalent to that. And so if you want to know where that came from, that's tit for tat. And finally, it leads to what we now know to be the case, that they're beginning to do the same thing to us. You know, uh, Rabbi Hillel and Confucius were right. Uh, you should not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. Should we end it? Stop running these, these reconnaissance I off think, the coast? I can tell you from having worked in this area in the U.S. government that a great deal of this is driven by the availability of platforms rather than by requirements for information. We need to do a hard check on what information we really need see how we can acquire it at minimal offense to those from whom we're acquiring it and adjust and it may be too late because uh, this has been going on since uh, 2001 um, actually this pro the, 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 the great increase in this activity along the China coast happened in 2000 and um, I'll just tell you how it happened um, it happened because um, in 2000, after long study, the uh, U.S. military decided that, that, in fact, the Soviet Union had permanently disappeared, and that, um, and that therefore the use of reconnaissance platforms against Russia was probably not needed, and so they released this target. So no longer there was no longer the Russian target. So this happened in the fall of 2000 which was, you know, every four or eight years, the United States administers a frontal lobotomy to itself. <laughs> and we were in the process of doing this. Uh, the government was disintegrating as everybody headed for Wall Street. Um, and, the, the, um, um, and the new people, nobody knew who they would be. So, um, so nobody was home. And, uh, the system defaulted to the next target, which was China. So suddenly you had an increase from roughly one, one flight a week to one a day. And the Chinese said, what's going on? You know, how's this? And they complained and complained, and then they started buzzing the aircraft, and that led to the EP-3 incident. Um, and that was mishandled on both sides. So we now have, we have a, something like a dozen years uh, or more of this phenomenon and I think what the Chinese have concluded is that we're not going to listen to them and that the only way they can stop this is by getting into a reciprocity game by doing attack runs on San Diego uh, which might get our attention and that was how the US-Russian relationship worked we were restrained because we didn't want to provoke them into doing <coughs> unrestrained things I think that's terribly sad and I think grown up people ought to be able to do better than that. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's... You don't date it to, to 96, then? No, 96... That, that you have an increased, you know, what, what you no. hear from our military and, and others is that as a result of the Li Donghui visit, you began to see, and the Chinese shooting off missiles, you began to see increased deployments, increased use of submarines, therefore the necessity for us to increase reconnaissance. You don't... No, I don't. I think 96 was... Um, did convince the Chinese that we were serious, that we might be serious about intervening in Taiwan. Um, but it was not until 1999, July 9, 1999, when Li Donghui 
Vatican that Deutsche Welle announced his two-state doctrine, in effect declaring independence without using the word, that the Chinese came really to grips with the problem they had. And, um, and in early August of 1999, they had a meeting at Beidacha, one of the last of those, uh, at which they decided to do two things. One was to give the PLA the budget finally to be able to do Taiwan, by which they didn't mean invade it, but destroy it, um, deter Taiwan from doing bad things. Uh, and uh, second, uh, to open up a united front policy where they cultivated relationships with all sorts of people on the island. And both policies have been pursued and by 2008, which was the target date for reaching uh, military dominance in the Taiwan Strait. They basically had done that. Uh, and uh, by 2005, uh, 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 Nianjan had responded to the overall policy uh, by uh, reestablishing Guangdong relations with the Chinese Communist Party and beginning a process of rapprochement, which is still <coughs> in progress. So, um, so I would date it more from 1999 when the budget really got wrapped up. And um, uh, but you still would predominantly attribute the existence of the platform that created this situation. That the platform was there, so the military said we ought to use it, as opposed to the Chinese started doing stuff in no. '96 or '99. No, I mean you can always find a rationale for anything uh, but if you are determined to do so. And if you have, you know, I don't know, X number of EP3s and you can fly Y number of flights and suddenly you don't need Y for one target, you fly Y against another target. Uh, that's, I'm sorry to say, the mindless manner in which, well, read Catch-22 if you want to understand the military mentality. <laughs> um, so I can't see who, is that Roxanne? Oh no, but behind. Is that Roxanne? It is. Roxanne, is that you? I can't bear. Yeah. I have um, two questions. Uh, one is raised by your comment that the Chinese could provide the money for us restoring our infrastructure, bridges, and whatever. And by that, do you mean that the Chinese should send over armies of workers to um, rebuild our cities? And, um, you know, <laughs> And so I'll ask the second question. In your book, which I look forward to reading, do you address uh, problems that we all share of, of climate change? And uh, if one of the causes of Chinese rapid industrialization has been extreme pollution. Right. Extreme pollution that is affecting not only people in China, pollution of food and groundwater and waterways and the disappearance of rivers and so forth. Uh, and the use of, you know, wild use of automobiles. Frankly, I'm not stopping from now on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder whether you anticipate, you must anticipate negotiations at this level between our two countries and others in the United States. Um, on the subject of infrastructure, um, no, uh, not armies of Chinese workers. We did that in the 19th century to build railroads. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, money for American jobs. Why? Because it's a good investment for Chinese to do that. And because they have been re there have been repeated meetings among the key exporting countries, economies in East Asia, Japan, South Korea, China, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and so on, um, over the, the problem of infrastructure in the United States. Um, they are affected by our economic inefficiency. Uh, so there's an, oh, there's a focus on this. Uh, so I have in mind toll roads, um, railroads that pay, um, things that are pay as you go, uh, where an investor can make a decent return. Uh, and I don't have in mind uh, armies of workers. And here I'll just tell you a quick story uh, about the late Muammar Gaddafi and, and I. Um, I had a conversation with him in the middle of the desert, uh, which started off badly when um, I asked him why he was trying to kill my friend, the, the king of Saudi Arabia. 
uh, and he quoted Noam Chomsky to me at great length. <laughs> um, out of order, I think. But um, they, uh, he then asked me to change the subject. He said, uh, "What are they? What's my image abroad?" And I gulped. What was I going to say? And so I said, "Sir, they think you're a dangerous nut." And he started laughing. And so he thought I was probably straight, and so he asked me what I thought about his economy. And I said, well, I haven't been here very long, uh, but what I've seen suggests to me that it's an utter mess. <laughs> and um, he said, uh, well, what do you mean? I said, well, for example, I said, do you know uh, how much uh, uh, cement you have on order? He said, no. I said, well, you have 19 million tons of cement on order. Do you know what your port handling capacity for cement is? No. I said, you can bring in 1,100 tons of cement a day. It'll take you 300 years to bring in <laughs> cement if you have an order. And you have the world's third largest uh, reserves of limestone. You have gas and you have water. Why aren't you making cement and exporting it? He said, well, nobody ever said that to me before. I said, well, I said it. So he said, uh, well, can you fix that? I said, sure. but. Uh, since Senator Lautenberg, may he rest in peace, has undone the Lockerbie Agreement, um, I can't bring in an American company, but I have a Chinese friend who's got a company that's built uh, 30 uh, cement plants in the last three years. He could probably do it. And uh, so we ended up at a meeting with the Libyans and my Chinese friend who was happy to go to Frankfurt to see, because his son was studying in Paris. Um, negotiating a, uh, a deal to build cement plants in Libya. And at the end of this, it was about a two hour meeting, and we, I did the interpreting, and we got the whole thing done and um, in general terms. And the Libyans said to my friend, Chinese friend, well, how long is it gonna take you to execute this project? And um, my friend said, well, do I have to build the quarry? They said, yes. He said, we did some calculations at 17 months. Mm -hmm. And they said, the French said they wanted to charge us three times what you're charging us, and they said it would take four years. And how come you can do that um, in 17 months? And he said, well, um, you know, very tactfully, he said, I've been to your country and it's beautiful. Uh, but um, uh, with all due respect to your country, I don't think Chinese engineers are going to want to spend any longer there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, um, so we and we have we pay them by the project, not by the time. Uh, and we tell them you should only work ten hours a day, and they work sixteen. We tell them you should only work five days a week or six, and they work seven. And we tell them you can't. You should take vacations, and they refuse. Seventeen months, he said. Um, now, what's the issue? The issue is distrust on the part of Chinese construction companies with the local workforce. Chinese construction companies are working in the United States and they know the local workforce is sound. So this issue is not going to be a problem. The second question, climate change, uh, the book does talk a little bit about it, not much, uh, mostly because I think it's gonna get fixed as a result of internal pressure inside China, not pressure from outside. And in fact, about three fourths of the large-scale disturbance, public disturbances in China now are related to environmental issues, um, mostly having to do with corruption and land takings and abuse of national regulations by local officials because of this combination of boosterism and entrepreneurship that I call cadre capitalism. So the pressure is on for China to deal with this, and in fact, China is doing some interesting things. Uh, carbon trade schemes in seven different regions of China. Um, and I believe uh, China, uh, like Japan before it, remembering Japan when it was filthy, um, can mitigate, remediate, and cure this issue. Uh, and I actually have a very hopeful, in particular, about shale in China, because they lack water which means they have to inject CO2 for the pressure, which means they've got to find a way, and they are working on it, to take CO2 out of carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere, and inject it back into the earth. You want to talk about a virtuous cycle? That's it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not pessimistic.
I have two hands still up very quickly because okay. we're out of, just about out of town. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just I have a question about bond holding. Uh, yesterday, we have time to have an article on bond holding and call it uh, Chinese Kissinger. You know, he's a political scientist who has worked for John Lee since 1995 and he will come to uh, California this weekend. Right. You know, I'm just curious uh, about your analyzing about his rule on you know, uh, U.S.-China uh, relation uh, decision making process. Okay, well, we had we had one little check okay, the other question. Sure. Wasn't there another? Yeah, Martin. Oh, you know, um, you said you were louder, real loud. Oh, you said you were a bit apprehensive about this meeting tomorrow. I'm just wondering if one of the reasons you're apprehensive about it is because you see a disparity in the level of statesmanship or leadership between the current leaders and perhaps, let's say, Kissinger and John Locke. <laughs> Can I just add to Marty's question? You said you were hoping people would come, the two would come to a meeting of the mind. If the if President Xi and President Obama have to come to a meeting of minds, who's going to have to bend more? Hmm. Very good questions. Um, I, 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 I met Mr. Wang years ago when he was in Shanghai. Uh, I've not seen him since he became the Aminos Gris of uh, of, uh, of the, the Central Committee. Um, and uh, so I don't really want to talk about him personally, but I think this does open uh, an interesting issue. Um, I think something important is going on in interaction between Chinese politics and Chinese economic restructuring. China's economic model has outlived its useful life. It has to be changed. I would argue we ours needs to be changed too, but leave us out of it. Uh, there is widespread recognition at the top by, by certainly by Xi Jinping, by Li Keqiang, and others that China needs to fundamentally redirect uh, its economy toward consumption-driven growth rather than investment-driven growth, and toward domestic rather than foreign markets. This treads on a vast number of vested interests in China. The very miracle of Chinese growth has created huge bureaucratic and corporate structures and systems of entrepreneurs, associations, which are uh, determined to keep the advantages they have, which they would lose to some extent in these reforms. So what's the answer politically? Uh, Xi Jinping just took office. Uh, Wang, by the way, is quite nationalistic, as I think that article says. Um, and I think Mr. Xi has, is burnishing his leadership credentials uh, by, uh, by being assertively patriotic. Uh, and, um, and among other things, um, uh, instead of continuing to allow, from the Chinese perspective, um, the occupation of disputed territories in the South China Sea by other claimants, uh, China is going to roll that back to the extent it can. Um, and, uh, and it's doing this, I think, in part because of a trade-off between the need for strong nationalist patriotic leadership to be able to deal with the vested interests domestically from, from a position of authority. Uh, so I don't know how to answer the question about whether uh, which side has uh, the uh, advantage in terms of statecraft and statesmanship. Uh, but I, I do know that Mr. Obama in, inhabits a pretty pathetic political environment at present. Um, and Mr. Xi does not. Uh, so, um, uh, if you ask uh, who has the capacity to decide and deliver, uh, I think it's uh, an open and shut case that Mr. Xi is in a stronger position. That gets to the last question: who has to, who has to yield if there is to be a meeting of the minds? Um, we have a very odd inversion of things in this relationship. On the one hand, China is the rising power, we are the established one. 
on the other hand, it's we who are demanding change, not the Chinese. That's a very sort of strange situation uh, to, to be in. And I'm talking about the global order. Um, um, so, um, I think we both need to rethink things. Uh, I'll just put it that way. Uh, China has come a long way from the days when it was weak and vulnerable um, and victimized, uh, but it is still very thin-skinned and quick to take offense. And it is also prone to conspiracy theories. And because Chinese like strategy and stratagems, they see them in others where they're not existent. The Chinese actually look at the United States and think we have a master plan. I wish we did. <laughs> um, and I think on our, for our part, reflecting the mess in Washington, we're much too complacent. We don't really understand the, the extent to which the world has changed. Uh, and we need to make major adjustments. And if China can help us make those adjustments, then I say God bless China. Please join me in thanking Chaz for this wonderful